Bird. I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007. Hearing it. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support for the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be tomorrow night March 24th, when I will have a discussion with Timothy Brennan about his new biography of Edward Said, Places of Mind. Please mark your calendars and register for this free event on Zoom at the Leon Levy website. But tonight we are here to celebrate Annalyn Swan and Mark Stevens for their new biography of the artist Francis Bacon. They will be in conversation with Michael Kimmelman. Please look for these biographies online at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Annalyn Swan is a former senior arts direct editor of Newsweek and author with Mark Stevens of the Pulitzer Prize winning De Kooning, an American master. Swan began her career as a writer at Time magazine, then joined Newsweek in 1980 as music critic and sub subsequently became the magazine's arts editor. She currently teaches in the biography and memoir master's program at the Graduate Center of City University of New York, as well as at the Red Lode Middlebury School of English. Mark Stevens is the author with Annalyn Swan of De Kooning, an American master, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2005, the National Book Critics Circle Prize for Biography and the Los Angeles Times Prize in Biography. Stevens was the art critic for Newsweek between 1977 and 1988, and later he wrote about art for the New Republic and New York Magazine. Michael Kimmelman is an author, critic, columnist, and pianist, the most acute American art critic of his generation, in the words of Australian writer Robert Hughes. Mm. He is the art architecture critic for the New York Times Magazine and has written about public housing, public space, landscape, architecture, community development, and equity and urban design. He has twice been a Pulitzer Prize finalist, most recently in 2018 for his series on climate change and global cities. In March, 2014, he was awarded the Brendan Gill Prize. Michael Kimmelman will conduct a conversation with Swan and Stevens for about 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions from our virtual audience. We're now on a Zoom format, so remember to click on the chat box below at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. And Michael will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. Annalyn and Mark, congratulations once again on this formidable accomplishment. Michael, I now turn the rest of the evening's event over to you. I understand that the authors have a few slides, however, to, to present before we begin. Thank you. Thank you, Kai, so much. Um, I just wanted to pick up on one thing before we start our slideshow, which is today is the official uh, pub date of our book in the U United States. And I can think of no better way than to be celebrating tonight by uh, being in the series at the Graduate Center. As Kai mentioned, I've been teaching um, in the trenches of the Graduate Center since 2014. So we're going to do something a little different uh, tonight. We're going to start with a sort of rolling montage of images that was done for us by Henny Productions over in England. And we will sort of talk as the slides roll. And so we will begin with that now and then have the discussion. Uh, Bacon was born into a mostly stuffy Edwardian family. His mother was very, very rich. His father was a dyspeptic, grumpy soldier. And he grew up among the so-called big houses of the Anglo-Irish world, living on quite a grand scale with many servants not too far from Dublin. Nothing mattered in that world more than a horse. But Bacon was an asthmatic little boy who was allergic to horses. And that's a pretty good beginning to the story, I think. Uh, on the left, you see his grandmother, Granny Supple, and on the right, you see his nanny, uh, 
Uh, Bacon was a sickly and girlish boy and an embarrassment to his father. And Granny Supple, well, women in general really saved him. Uh, in his early, early adolescence, Granny Supple, um, who was not stuffy, brought him into society, took him around to parties and showed him that life could, uh-oh, be fine. <laughs> uh-oh. <laughs> yes, that's better. Um, uh, he's, he learned from Granny Supple that, that the world could be a joy as well as, as, as well as painful. And from Granny and from na his nanny, he got a sort of ongoing consistent affection. Now I think we can go on to the next um, slide. Well, I'll save you. Okay, okay so, so I'll take over here for the moment. Um, this is uh, Francis Bacon's actual debut show not the uh, famous art show of 1945. Uh, uh, what Francis Bacon strove mightily to, um, to hide for the rest of his life and erase from his record was that he was actually a successful designer before he became a painter. He went to Europe and uh, specifically France for a year and a half, learned about uh, modern French design, came back and decided that he would uh, apply that trade in uh, London. He also met some very important people in the field. One of them um, helped him arrange this show 1930 at his Queensberry News studio. This is a shot he sent to his mother who was uh, very proud, of course, that her son had had such an early success. Um, the, the extent to which Francis Bacon hid this for the rest of his life was remarkable and was one of the key uh, the revelations that we had to unpeel like the onion uh, as we did our biography. And from here in 1928, uh, that if we could go to the next slide. Um, in 1933, five years later, um, Francis Bacon made his debut on the public stage as a painter. This is a, a show, this is his 1933 crucifixion. It ran at a very important show at a, a brand new uh, fashionable Freddie Mayer gallery. And this was included in a book by Herbert Reed, one of the leading uh, critics of the time in a, in a book called Art Now. It was across from a Picasso. So if you can imagine uh, you know, how, how proud Bacon would be about that. The, the interesting thing about this is it's a Picasso-esque image, but it also has a kind of uh, ectoplasmic quality that is all Bacon's own. And based on this, you would have thought that he had set himself up for a you know, budding and marvelous career. This was bought by one of the major collectors of the time, Sir Michael Sadler. However, shortly thereafter, uh, the, the gallery dropped him. He became, embarked on a, a very uh, unproductive, uh, not unproductive in, in terms of what he was doing in terms of his art, but uh, professionally, he just went into a dark hole uh, until early in the 1940s. He pr basically vanished for a decade. And this is, um, he, he vanished for a decade, but he worked very hard the entire time, something else that he wanted to conceal. But this is the painting that he wanted the world to think he suddenly painted almost out of nowhere, that there was almost no precedent. Uh, he finished it in 1944. It's called Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion. And it's the triptych that really launched his career at the end of World War II. Um, there are many things striking about this picture. One of them is the vile, orange color. That was just a terrible shock to Londoners who at the end of the war wanted to retreat to a soft and cozy kind of drawing room and restore pre-war English culture. Uh, it was re reminiscent of wartime fires in London. And the toothy, among the creatures themselves, I think that the toothy one in the center with the bandage uh, is the most interesting, um, although they're all pretty great monsters. The toothy one in the center is strangely friendly, almost intimate. It's as if he knows you. In other words, the monster that led to the wars of the century was not simply the bad guys, not simply the Germans, not simply quote unquote, the other. The monster was also you. So moving from here into so this is 19, uh, he painted in 1944. 1945 was the great so shock show that Mark just alluded to. And now suddenly here, uh, he begins in the late forties, a series of, of heads, one more frightening than the next. This is head one of 1948. Um, 
notice, not, notable uh, for its chiaroscuro, for the incredible snarling half human, uh, half man creature. Uh, David Sylvester, the great Bacon uh, critic and friend, uh, noted that tassel that connects the, the ear of the monster up to the top of the painting and the enormous tension that is put upon that line. This was 1948. And then we turn to five years later, uh, a study, the, uh, the, the, uh, the study after uh, Pope Innocent X by Velasquez. Again, uh, uh, Francis Bacon is still in the, in the world of sort of murky shadows uh, and monstrous creatures. But this is coming out of his most famous uh, uh, painting series, The Popes of the Early 50s. And this one is, as you notice, is becoming much more grand. There's still the, 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 the face, the Richter of, of terror, the, the open mouth. But at the same time, you have the grandness, the, the, the railings the, behind him. He's seated on a sort of throne. And this is going to be uh, moving in another direction in Francis Bacon's work as we watch the decades go on. Okay, we're gonna have the next one now. Yeah, um, that grandeur, by the way, it's, it's also sort of moth-eaten, which is part of the, the visual pleasure of his work. This is Peter Lacey, the great love of Bacon's life. Bacon always tried to pretend that he was, no, nope, let's go, that's not yet. Uh, tried to pretend that he was invulnerable to love, that he was really um, curiously apart from the ordinary human emotions. But in fact, he fell head over heels with this man, Peter Lacey. And the re relationship has regularly been character, I mean, caricatured uh, in writing and uh, in films as a kind of violent sadomasochist, sadomasochistic folly. In fact, um, despite the violence and turmoil, it was the most meaningful and poignant relationship in the lives of both of these men. It was a serious and substantive affair, not just a, a movie reel, a dark movie reel. And it un ended only with Lacey's death in 1962. Okay, we can go to the next. This is uh, called Two Figures, 1953, and it's occasionally nicknamed jokingly and not so jokingly as The Buggers. Uh, it's an iconic portrayal of homosexual passion. It's doubtful that there's a greater one. It couldn't be exhibited in, in 1953 when it was made um, because the uh, people who exhibited would have been arrested. Lucian Freud, not himself homosexual, admired this painting so much that he kept it over his bed until the end of his life. Freud probably loved the painting, the paint handling, the composition, but also the extraordinary way that painting captures both ferocity and tenderness. Okay, we can move on. This is a portrait of Isabel Rothorn, a great friend of Bacon. It's called Isabel Rothorn Standing in a Street in Soho from 1967. One of the things that we uh, sort of uh, threads we teased out about Bacon was, you know, the fact that Bacon and all his male, you know, friendships and uh, his tempestuous life uh, swashbuckling around Soho, where were the women? But in fact, he had many very good women friends. And in the 60s, which is a decade that he turned increasingly to portraiture, um, he painted at least 15 portraits of Isabel Rothorn and, and about another 10 of Henrietta Morris. Um, so this one, uh, Isabel was a marvelous figure who had been uh, the lover of Giacometti in Paris. She lived the high life with the intellectual world in Paris in the 1940s. This tremendously impressed Francis Bacon, who was a Francophile of the first order. Um, but this is the grandest of, of the portraits that he did of her. It's full size, many others were, were smaller, and it gets, gets to the sort of energy and, and uh, the sense of presence that she has. Uh, after Lacey died, Bacon was attracted to a succession of working class lovers, uh, the most well known of whom is George Dyer, an East Ender and petty thief. Uh, kind of an incompetent thief, a bumbling thief, who everyone described as a remarkably sweet but rather lost person. Uh, George loved to dress up in finery and Bacon loved to dress him up in finery. 
The critic John Russell called him, however, an English everyman, and Bacon particularly admired the line of his profile. This is a quite sad uh, photograph that comes right after the other because this is actually right after George Dyer has died. This is November of 1971. Francis Bacon is celebrating his, his uh, great retrospective at the Grand Palais in Paris, the first uh, British artist ever to be uh, asked, invited to show there. Um, the, the night before this great show of his, his 124 paint, his massive show, uh, George Dyer overdosed on uh, drugs and alcohol in the loo of their hotel room. And uh, undaunted and speaking to his unbelievable strength of character and determination, Francis Bacon went through with the show and was standing here at that dinner. Uh, the word was already beginning to go around, where's George? And then it, of course, emerged subsequently that he had died. But this is a, a, a magnificent, <laughs> portrait in its way of a man who could carry on nerves of steel and get through such an event like this, 500 people uh, in this restaurant, the, the Tramp Bleu restaurant, and George sitting up in the hotel room on the loo dead. After George died, Bacon painted several uh, triptychs about his death. This one's called Triptych August 1972. Jesus. And together they represent a, a really remarkably deep and varied, even profound meditation on death. There's really nothing else like them in 20th century art. I'm always struck, and you might just look at it for a while, um, by the central panel again. On, the, on either wing, you see a person who's still alive and there's organic movement and texture in the color and in the bodies. In the central panel, What's so striking, I think, is that violet pool, that cold, still, implacable violet. There's no heartbeat there. Here we have uh, a sort of overlooked um, uh, aspect of Bacon's painting, which was his, his self-portraits. Um, I mentioned earlier, he began painting many portraits in the 1960s. But towards the end, he, he, he painted uh, many more of himself. And the reason he t said for that was that all of the people that he loved had died and he only had himself. He, he uh, sort of famously did not paint from models. So he had to summon a friend up onto the canvas out of his imagination. Um, the two portraits here, one in 1972 on the right, uh, he has emerged, Bacon is emerging from the absolute despair uh, that followed the, the death of George Dyer. He felt immensely guilty about that. But he painted, uh, have, must have been 30 self-portraits over the course of his life. The one on the left is absolutely um, harrowing itself because in 1979, this is uh, Francis Bacon, 1979, um, he, a lot of his friends, uh, really close friends, Muriel Belcher of the colony, Sonia uh, Orwell, uh, John Deacon, the photographer, had all died. He realized that uh, John Edwards, his last serious uh, lover, uh, was never going to kind of come into his life the, the way he wanted. So he painted himself here, as we say, as sort of an aging queen uh, with, with, you know, just nothing but despair uh, about this self-portrait. Uh, it's sort of, and we described it as crushing pathos. Um, Bacon is, he's best known for screams, of course, as you saw in the, uh, in the Pope picture, but, but actually he was just as good at whispers and a kind of whispering melancholy. And this is his last painting, his farewell to the ring. Um, like Picasso, he enjoyed uh, the uh, ancient panoply of uh, bullfighting. Um, but here he used uh, nothing but hushed grays, which he mixed with actual dust, in fact, the dust that all his life had filled his asthmatic lungs and choked him. Uh, one horn of this bull, as you can see, um, and this bull is surely, is surely enunciatory. It's a bull who's bringing him the news of his own death. One horn of this bull is uh, shaped like a scythe, an ancient symbol of mortality. And, and that is that. the end. <laughs>
Um, so thank you guys so much, and thank you for this book. It's it's um, it's really just wonderful and uh, a, a major achievement and um, an extraordinary read. It's it's uh, such a pleasure about such an interesting and in America perhaps not as well appreciated or understood painter still. Um, I, I wanted to begin with um, with there's so much to talk about, and I wanted to begin with something that you describe in the beginning of the book, in the prologue, if I could read it. You say, Bacon put off most serious efforts to write about his life. He resisted such efforts partly because he wanted to control his image, but also because he kept secrets, actually one big secret. And you go on to say, it was Bacon's secret that he was not just a radical master of the 20th century stage who exulted in the dark arts. He was simultaneously an Englishman suffused with longing for the ordinary patterns of joy and solace denied him as a child and young man. I think one of the things I see running throughout this book and, and that you, you try to weave is this kind of paradoxical nature of Bacon, which is both in his, in his work and, and in, his, in his life, stemming from his childhood, which you mentioned. Maybe, maybe you could just flesh that out a little bit. I mean, what is it about Bacon that was paradoxical. Do you want to start, Mark? Well, I'm, he's one of the paradoxes is that uh, he was a person who loved the re revelation, the explosion from the closet, but he was also a man who was deeply hidden. And another paradox related to this is that he was, he was very invested in creating a persona for himself, which is what we all know about Bacon, the hard drinking Soho man, the person who said, uh, champagne for my real friends, real pain for my sham friends. That, the, guy who, the guy who was a wit and a wildy, wildy in figure. In fact, he, um, he had many other dimensions. And what we uh, try to do in the book is to reveal the ordinary aspects of Bacon, as well as the extraordinary ones, and show how he concealed and, uh, and revealed at the same time, again and again and again. Uh, just to add to that, uh, Michael, one of the, the interesting things that really never came out before our book was the uh, enormous effort that was put into this performance. You know, So uh, on the one hand, he seemed like the, this grand figure. He was the man who commanded every room. But behind it was a paralyzingly shy uh, mm. little boy still, because he was so paralyzingly shy in Ireland and the massive amounts of drugs in addition to alcohol that allowed the performance to go on was just astounding. And this had never been explored before. The drugs were medicinal for the most part um, too, you know, I mean, for his asthma and for heart problems and other things. So he, uh, he really was kept together by string and bandages. I mean, he, you portray him of course, as, a, as this self-construction, I guess everybody is on some level, but coming out of this childhood, this sort of weakling um, child of this family, so, sort of an outcast who, who was secretly um, teaching himself to be an artist, another thing that he wanted to disguise and, and sort of come on to the scene as this larger than life uh, figure. I, as you say, an iconoclast who becomes an icon, which we, maybe we can get to. What, what was it that he, why did he want to, you, you do this really interesting work in revealing um, uh, his early years, uh, you know, doing design and um, and his early sort of training as an artist. What, why did he want to conceal all of that? What what was the myth he was creating? Well, the myth was that he, uh, you know, sprang uh, full, fully formed from the head of Zeus. That that was the myth he wanted to portray. He always said later in life that he spent his youth. Uh, doing nothing, going to the, you know, to the theater, going to bars, never read. Well, of course, this is absolute nonsense. He became a great reader when, uh, as far back as when he had a, uh, a local uh, parson as his tutor in England. He became, uh, you know, very interested in, in Aeschylus, in particular, the Greek tragedians. His reading list that he took at the age of 19 to Ireland is astonishing. <laughs> we have the diaries of his first uh, serious male companion that fortunately had this information, but he really did not want to, re uh, you know, break a sweat. Part of it was that he was that English upper class thing that, you know, you don't break a sweat. And the, and the other thing, he just, you know, he never wanted to re reveal the there there. 
Mm. Yeah, it is. He, he did have an aristocratic predisposition from his background. And as you know, aristocrats are not supposed to, as Anlin says, break a sweat or have to in any way work hard. Mm -hmm. um, he also understood surely that, uh, that if it looked like he just did this out of nothing, that he must be some kind of genius, right? <laughs> that he could, uh, without any training, become, become Francis Bacon. He liked that miraculous thing. It's a lot like the way that he, he loved gambling for the same reason, partly the same reason, that he loved the idea of fate suddenly just picks number 13 or 14 and you're, you're, you make a million dollars. I mean, that kind of thing, that feeling of the power of fate really appealed to him. Yeah, I mean, he was, um, you, you talk about his gambling. He, he wasn't um, grasping about money. He wasn't somebody who sort of wanted what we would now consider a kind of celebrity. He, he obviously wanted to occupy this world that he created um, and he wanted to operate in it as he chose, but you know, he never was sort of just accumulating wealth for the sake of it. He never was sort of selling himself in the way we now think of as a, um, you know, a typical way that someone make, turns himself into a celebrity. He, he had a notion of what, um, what fame looked like, obviously, and it was really inseparable from work. Um, the, uh, clearly, he, the, he, you, I think the last word in your book is work. Um, he goes back to work. So there was this really intensely serious aspect of him, um, which, um, which, as you say, in a way, he, it wasn't really disguising, I guess, was it? But it was, it was made to seem effortless. Well, one, one really interesting thing for us that no one had ever uh, sort of gone into and, and, and looked at, it's he was so controlling of his career. He wasn't interested in money, you're absolutely right, but he was so controlling of his career that if you look at how in 1975, when they were planning the, his show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, in New York, and then again, when, when the Grand Palais show was happening, uh, and then the final, the second Tate retrospective, he was all over it. I mean, the, right. some of the, the, the largest and longest correspondence that, that we have from Francis Bacon was letter after letter to Rousseau at the, at the Met. And similarly at the Tate, um, he, was, he, was, he was determined to have everything his way. He wanted the, the greatest, you know, the, the grandest salon. He would go in and insist on rehanging paintings, even if it meant going in at midnight. And you know that very much goes against the the common notion of Francis Bacon, who was you know, you know, frothing his way through life. Not at all. Yeah, I didn't. Mean, forgive me. I didn't mean that he did. He he um, he was frothing his way through life. In fact, I think that Grand Palais show you mentioned, Dyer's death, is really interesting because for people who don't know that story, and you you tell it in detail, so we understand that he didn't walk out of the. He didn't wake up to find Die Dyer on the toilet dead and just go to, there's a whole sort of backstory um, and a group of people around who were um, involved in this and trying to make sure that the show went off as, as planned. Um, but there was in that story too, um, a seriousness about how, as you say, Bacon presented himself and presented his work. And um, I, did, I didn't mean that, I, I meant really that he, um, he, he, there was these two sides to him, this intensely uh, serious, hardworking artist um, who took his work very clearly, and then this kind of bon vivant character who, who wanted his public image to be um, sort of outsized, and, uh, and they, were not they weren't the same thing. In other words, reading into the pictures, that portrayal, which I think has often been done, and which you read out of them, um, the, the kind of, you know, outrage for Grand Guignol for the sake of Grand Guignol, that, that's not how you see his work, right? You see his work as being deeply serious. Well, Grand Guignol is, a, is of course, the negative attack, that, or the negative phrase that has often been used in his work. But if you look at some of the ancient Greek myths, uh, which, which he was uh, very inspired by, and which he took very seriously, if you look at ancient, if you look at classical drama, tragedy, and you see what happens in those places, you see birds picking at intestines. And I mean, if you actually read the Greeks, you will see that they have, that Bacon has nothing on them. Uh, Grand Guignol is a, is a complicated kind of concept. There's a way, there's a way that if you, if you press really hard, 
um, you can displace in an, in an interesting respect. You can displace into kind of cartoon corniness, but you can also displace uh, into, into realms of feeling that cannot otherwise be expressed except by going too far. Um, for, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, one of, one of his uh, triptychs after George died has a, an image of death in which is this kind of cartoonish shadow emerges from it. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of disagreeable to look at because, because it, it seems kind of Disney-like. Now Bacon was surely aware of that. He wanted that kind of strangely artificial uh, displacing uh, nervous feeling. I mean, death can be cartoonish. You look at the, at the, at the poses that dead people are placed in before they've been arranged, hmm. you know, that's goofy. So huh. he, he wanted to work with all that kind of material um, on the edge of things, just like just like the the Greek dramatists were often. Did you? Can I ask you just a general question? Did you? Because you've done this remarkable biography of de Kooning, um, and there was in the art world a kind of divide, I think, uh, between what was happening in Europe and what was happening in America. America kind of felt in the S after the Second World War that it was taking over the mantle of innovative work. And Bacon was, you know, very much in the British scene. Um, did, how was your sense of, <laughs> so the larger sense of post-war, the, the, the post-war balance, I guess you might say, um, altered by doing this work in relation to de Kooning? How, did Bacon make you think differently about American painting or um, did you come to Bacon with a different set of preconceptions because you'd done de Kooning? I think we both have to answer that one because we might differ in our answers. Um, you know, I Francis Bacon made me respect uh, de Kooning maybe even more. And um, I, I think it's because it, it, that at one point in his life, Francis Bacon in the late 50s uh, was verging towards a sort of uh, abstract expressionism himself. Uh, they had all seen the American uh, Abstract Expressionist show that had come through Europe and the sort of sense of uh, scale and the brush strokes and the palette, you know, and the immediacy, the personal touch of de Kooning's hand in those paintings. Um, so when, when I look at them, I mean, I think they're both incredibly uh, important artists and both have personal myths that are, are remarkable from the point of view of, of a biographer. But um, you, you would think that I, we ha would have settled back in the figurative tradition. But for me, I have no idea about Mark, but um, I really would go back and look at de Kooning almost as a rest, particularly after something like the 62, three studies for a crucifixion, which is blood. And, and you know, it, it is what we know. Uh, so that's my take on it. Well, I would say that, um, yes, uh, I, think, I think the, the, the landscape of art history is changing. Uh, very rapidly now about how we think about the 40s, 50s, and, and the subsequent decades. And there's, there's a much less the Greenbergian notion that there's a, there's a progressive evolution of art that insists that art move in a certain direction and not in others is all but gone. Um, Bacon, but it was very powerful when Bacon was painting in the 50s, including among some English artists who were looking to America. Uh, Bacon held on to the figure. He insisted upon that. Um, and De Kooning also held on to the figure. De Kooning's figure is more disguised, but he too held on to the figure. And, and for me personally, uh, the appeal of both of these artists has something to do with their insistence on, on the body, on physicality, and on holding on to certain um, visceral qualities, uh, aspects of touch that an increasingly abstract culture is uh, laying aside, putting aside. They both assert the body against the machine in a way. And I, so for me, they, they are complementary in that sense. I wanna ask you one more question about the art, but I also wanna ask you about working on biography and working together, which is such, such an interesting project and an interesting project for a marriage. Um, but I, I, I know you um, also felt that there was a diversity, a complexity to, um, to Bacon's work, which isn't always appreciated by people who, may have an image of the crucifixion or the Pope or one of the triptychs in mind, especially uh, landscape and some other areas which are less, um, maybe less familiar. Maybe you could just talk about that a little bit, sort of what, what the surprise was for you about Bacon uh, 
um, what you hadn't known from, from the perspective of his work. Alan, do you want to do that? I mean, we both have lots of views on that. But you first and then I'll follow. Well, although Bacon is, Bacon's regarded as a screamer, as I said, when I was talking about that bull painting, and he does have lots of screams. He was interested in that uh, sudden burst of the closet door when he's ah, sort of a jack and box uh, uh, fear and fright. But he was also a very subtle, melancholy painter. Bacon's work, he always said he wanted to paint a happy picture. He just couldn't figure out how to, but, but he, if you, if you, so he's on, he's on the blue spectrum, the emotionally blue spectrum, but within that blue spectrum, it ranges from screams all the way to the softest, most uh, uh, graceful kinds of personal melancholy and reflection, which you see in his self-portraits and in some other pictures too. Mm -hmm. So it was exciting for us to see that he had this range. And then later in his life, he makes these landscapes that are like nothing else in his work where uh, he sort of a, a clarifies, makes essential certain aspects of his sensibility in a way that is um, very, very new and is, is, is arresting. I'd like to add to that, that, um, you know, Francis Bacon, we, we, we have to acknowledge this, Francis Bacon painted a lot of bad paintings. So you cannot judge Francis Bacon as, uh, you know, de Kooning had a higher, you know, one out of 10 uh, average than Francis Bacon. Um, so you have to be selective when you're looking at his work. I mean, some of his later, like his second Pope series of the 50s were so uninspiring um, that you just sort of want them to go away. There's a famous one in the Vatican, which is terrible. Ah, you know, you, you want to say, oh, no, no, my painter didn't paint that. Um, but there are also wonderful Francis Bacon paintings. I mean, just, just remarkable, like the 1946, you know, uh, figure in, in, uh, at, that's at the, the Met with the famous black umbrella. You know, at his very best, he captured something about the, you know, the, the other side of life, the sort of the terror, uh, possibly more than the beautiful, or sometimes made the terror even beautiful. Uh, and if you pick him, and you overlook, say, the 80s when other artists said, oh, he's just Francis Bacon, all the tension uh, and they sort of the, the, uh, uh, the brushstroke, the aliveness of the brushstroke has disappeared because he, he was turning out these wonderful kind of blue chip Francis Bacon paintings. If you overlook those, there are marvelous paintings that could be seen in every decade of his life. So he's well worth um, considering for the position he holds. I mean, he does stand up as one of the the remarkable painters of the 20th century. Nobody can can ever look at a, a Francis Bacon painting and mistake it for somebody else. You also, know? you know, he was an autodidact. Uh, so he didn't have tra training to fall back upon. Uh, a person like de Kooning can never really make a, a really awful painting because he, he has so much training, he has so much uh, know-how that he's always gonna make the figure and the ground work together in some kind of interesting way. He might make lesser works even uh, works that you don't like, but they're never incompetent. Bacon had to do it all on his own and by himself. He had no real training or very little. So, so he's, uh, he takes much bigger risks in a way and he can never depend upon the figure and the ground working together uh, in the way that a trained artist would assure uh, they work together. Um, and that also is, is, is a gift because he can then make the figure ground uh, fresh in a new way. And, and if they don't work together, it becomes all the more exciting. But yes, he did, Anlin is, is certainly right. He made a lot of, of bad pictures. There's no denying it. Well, we, we all fail sometimes and that's the only way to try to do yeah. good work. I think um, the other thing that comes across very much is this sort of endearing quality to him, his, his, his uh, devotion to friends, his, his social circle there. You have these wonderful stories um, of dinner parties uh, and these social interactions, which are, you know, recall this kind of hothouse, um, but extraordinary culture in, in London. There's one, if I remember, he's at dinner sort of competing with Ashton, Frederick Ashton, um, <laughs> over a very attractive, what would be Bacon's next lover. And the, you just sense this, this world in which, actually, I, the one time I, I uh, was able to have lunch with them, um, Bacon and John Russell, the thing that I remember at Wheeler's, the thing that I remember <clears throat> was the two of them getting into this discussion about a movie which I didn't know and John Russell had not seen. 
and Bacon um, said, "Oh yes, you know it's uh, it stars um, it stars the Day Lewis boy," and then Russell, of course, knew what that meant because of Cecil Day Lewis. So it, there was I just sensed that it was this kind of universe of people who were constantly sort of acting for each other, posing for each other, challenging each other. It, it's and that comes across very beautifully in the book. I we, mean, we, we were uh, accused by one or two. Uh, curmudgeon, curmudgeonly uh, Brits of uh, sort of softening Bacon, but mm -hmm. and and from the general per perspective, you know, Bacon didn't want to show his soft side. You know, that that was one of the things that he hid in the great matador of the night as he marched around Soho. Um, but th the fact is that he was indeed a man who had these other dimensions. You know, he had he was very polite and, and taking care of his family and on and on and on. Of course, this doesn't really square with, with, the, with, the, with the swashbuckling, does it? Yeah. So but we didn't make, you know, we didn't make that up. I mean, we right. just took, you no, know, no. it's where the material took us, uh, this no. thing. I mean, he, like Alan said, he had these exquisite manners. David Sylvester said he was never rude unintentionally. Well, the thing is, uh, finally, no one had gone and, and done the sort of interviewing and the you know reading of every archival uh, material. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we undertook this project, because we knew that there was so much more to Bacon. And as you say, Michael, you know, one of them was, yeah, you know, he could be a very thoughtful, kind, considerate person who sent flowers to his friends who were dying, who got them out of the hospital. You know, who gave his first uh, dealer years later a huge amount of money because he felt guilty about leaving her for the Marlboro Gallery. So there you have it, a right. more complicated, complex character than had been, you know, uh, portrayed before in any of the uh, previous books. I'm, I'm getting a whole lot of questions, which are just wonderful. And so instead of <clears throat> just going through my list, I want to begin to ask some of them, starting with what drew you to Bacon as a subject? Was it his reputation, uh, a particular image that um, that lit, lit you on Bacon after the beginning? Why him? And what do you want? Do you want me to do this or? Well, I'll start, and then you can chime in as we've been doing. Um, the, well, the first thing is, that you, of course, you want to find the most um, important, interesting, significant artist to, to write about. But um, Francis Bacon had not had any biographies written of him for two decades. And of the biographies that had been written, uh, nobody had done the, the sort of uh, boots on the ground work that, that needed to be done. So, you know, we started at the beginning with Anglo-Irish society. You know, he grew up in <coughs> Ireland in this sort of hothouse culture. Uh, nobody had gone there. You know, we went to Tangier, we went to the south of France, we went to Spain, as, as Mark and I said along the way, gee, tough life. But, um, you know, that's what you have to do. You know, you have to really fill in the interstices of the life um, in a way that other people hadn't. And then, you know, uh, Bacon is an iconic figure and they don't grow on trees. And so when you've gone from somebody like de Kooning, who's an American master, um, and you look, you're, you know, you train your limbs and, and look across the Atlantic, who are you gonna look for who's a really fascinating human being as well as an artist? It's, it's the latter point that's most interesting really, because you want, you want, you want uh, a figure, and it's, there are not that many painters who are like this, who represent more than themselves somehow, who are emblematic figures for their society, their culture, their time. Mm -hmm. And Bacon, as a homosexual, as the kind of painter he was, uh, where he came from, what he did, he represents uh, 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 aspects of 20th century culture that other painters do not. So yep. he... I'm sorry, Mark, I was going to say one of the most interesting things about I could leap in is that you, 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 you convey that he really captured this particular moment, not just the work, but this, um, which obviously came at that, you know, post-war 1945 crucial moment um, when he finally hits the scene and when the work seems to speak so eloquently to, to, to that period. But, but also he was gay and he was openly gay and there was a you, you describe how in his later life, he was almost disturbed. He didn't like the word gay, for one thing, right. but he was also disturbed by the idea of a certain kind of normalization. I don't know. Um, he, he, he embodied and this, this idea of resistance and being out there, uh, which is a 
you know, seems almost <laughs> outdated now, but very interesting. That transitional moment from the war, the last half of the 20th century, uh, Bacon kind of embodied it in his person as well as in his work. Is that fair to say? Yes, he did not didn't want homosexuality to be sort of sanitized, oddly, or made mainstream. Uh, he did sign one petition in his life, and that was when the Thatcher government was uh, sort of toughening and strengthening uh, anti-homosexual uh, legislation. That was the only time that he ever got involved in any of that. But, you know, he, he famously said, well, why do we want to sort of celebrate being homosexual? We have enough problems otherwise in life. Um, and that was his stance. Yeah, you know, one one of the toasts in the colony when some when a when a uh, an outsider came in, uh, they would they would raise their glass and they would say, "Champagne for the norm." Right. You know, the norm being uh, the, the the strange character who was entering there. Yeah, there right. was a kind of glory and celebration of the margins, as you know, in post-war culture, right. and that it was thought um, paradoxically that that's the only place where real moral life could. Uh, be discussed right. or lived since the mainstream was uh, so bankrupt. So yes, he was. I think he was uh, regretful that the margins were becoming the mainstream towards the end of his life. And his theatrical work at the end uh, has a kind of postmodern quality. I think uh, commenting on that. Yeah. So um, okay. So here's an interesting question: What is it like for two authors to write a biography? Do you split duties like Rogers and Hammerstein? in terms of words and music, do you each focus on separate periods of the subject's life? How do you mesh writing styles? Most important, how do you stay married? Exactly. <laughs> that, that, That's that, all the subtext of that question. Why aren't you divorced? <laughs> that, that, is, that is literally the first question as we walk, went around uh, on the Kooning talking you know, around the country. Uh, the first question, the person would stand up, usually a woman, and say, I just don't know how you could possibly stay married to, to your husband and work on, you know, live and work together. Um, but to your question, um, these projects are absolute, um, they're Herculean, as you know, Michael. Um, what two, two different British critics called our book a flunker, you know, we tend to agree with that. Although I have to say only- I seven, call it obese. 705 pages are text, 100 pages are footnotes. So we have to register that with this audience, only 700 pages. Um, but Excellent. there's so much material. So, you know, we, we did split up at, in, in the beginning uh, as we did with de Kooning. You know, we will uh, go to individual periods, we'll focus on those. And then comes the uh, mulching together, endless working together to get the, as, as you said, you know, the tone uh, the pacing, everything in the book to work together. Yeah, it's just editing and revising, editing and re revising. And um, what I always say about that is that if two people write a book together, it just takes twice as long. <laughs> Not half. I, I think if you ask Shelley Wanger, our editor, she would more than agree with uh, th the fact that this takes a very long time in gestation. Well, it it's clearly works out, and you have a great editor in Shelley, obviously. Um, what the it, another question? What what resources were made available to you? Access to the estate of Francis Bacon, the Francis Bacon Foundation, the the Hugh Lane in Dublin. These are questions. So, all all of the above. I mean, we started with the Francis Bacon estate. We were not an authorized biography by any means, but um, they wanted something, or they were encouraging of us to come in and really do the thorough job. Uh, the three previous biographies were you know, written by friends and like Dan Farson, Michael Pepiat, it's a marvelous um, mem memoirist, uh, but his is a sort of personal kind of autobiography slash you know, biography. So what we were doing, it's coming in to do the whole nine yards. The estate did have resources for us uh, in terms of all of their the files that they had there. We, we could see some early vacant correspondence. We saw all of the records at the Marlboro Gallery, which were fantastic because you know he was at the Marlboro from early yes. the very early 50s until his death. Um, and then a lot we just you know would dig up on our own. We'd go to, I remember going to Trinity College, Cambridge, because Reb. Uh, Butler, Rab Butler, had been uh, a friend, you know, you know, the conservative politician, had been a friend of Bacon, and they had um, commissioned him to do their dining room of their house while he was still in his decorating career. And lo and behold, there's a couple letters in there that are helpful. 
uh, again, a lot, that takes that dog work takes a lot of time. And just one more example, though, my favorite one was going to Tangier, and no one had thought to go to the American American Legation uh, building in Tangier, and it has you know kind of become a, a fusty archive, uh, quasi museum. And in there were all the issues, the Tangier Times, and this little tittle tattle uh, that they were covering about the English uh, community uh, in Tangier. And so here we have Francis Bacon, you know, coming into this little hot house, and you know they have him in his first. He's get, getting off the boat practically, and then so we can follow him on the ground there for the rest of his like the from fifty five to you know sixty when he was often in Tangier. That remains my most delightful memory. You too, Mark. Tangier doesn't sound like a terrible uh, burden to have to bear. The hangovers aren't so good. <laughs> so uh, one of the questions I think um, I want to ask you, uh, uh, someone, someone is asking, can you comment on how Bacon has been appropriated by other artists? And I, and I want to get to that. But uh, there's another question you and I just talked about briefly the other day, and that is, you know, you're, you're an art critic, Mark, and you've spent so much of your life writing art criticism and yet you write these biographies, which are very, what, what is sort of the relationship between interpreting art? How much can you read into those pictures of biography? And what are the, what are the kind of pitfalls of doing that? Not just <coughs> It must be tricky. Well, I think one of the trickiest technical questions in biography, if you're writing about an imaginative person, an artist or a dancer, choreographer, that kind of thing, musician, is how you address the work. First of all, you never ever want to reduce the work to the life or the life to the art. You have to find a way to allow there to be echoes and conversation <clears throat> between the two, but they, you must not reduce them one to the other. There has to be some modesty and some mystery uh, there. The other thing, the more technical problem is how to address the actual work of art in the text. Because uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, but very often you're reading along uh, say you're reading about a choreographer and then the writer begins to try to describe a dance you can't see and it becomes this sort of indigestible pudding in the book. This, uh, this part that you wanna rush or, or skip, even though it's the reason that you're reading the book, you, know, you, you skip the art part. So you have to be able, you have to figure out how to maintain narrative line and the movement of the book, which requires not too much interpretation, not too much discursion, or it becomes about you. You have to be telling the story, but you also have to find a way to talk about the art, because why else are you writing this book? So what Anlin and I did is, is we, we write about individual works within the text briefly, but we do it at greater length in, in breakouts at the end of chapters. And in that way, it seems to me a more honest way to, to do that, because there's some literal space between uh, intensive analysis and subjective analysis, because analysis always has that subjective component, and the actual life, the narration of the life. This is also true of in literary biographies, because every year I teach in my class at the, at the Graduate Center, um, Richard Elman's classic biography of Oscar Wilde. He had the same problem because you could spend, you know, endlessly uh, on, on the works and how do you integrate them into the life. So some of our, our early thoughts um, were, you know, we, we have a nod to him because of the way he figured this out as well. You don't want to keep the narrative at all costs. You want the narrative drive, you know, to be telling the story and not digressing into, uh, you know, these little, as Mark said, these, these heavy lumps that would then stop the flow. Yeah, but I mean, you mentioned, for instance, in your little, um, you know, introduction of slides, that late work of the, the bull and how it's sort of the bull, I think you said, Mark, something like brings, is bringing death. And the bullfight is such an interesting metaphor there. Bacon went at the end of his life to Spain to die. It, um, and so there is, a, it's very hard not to look at, um, at the work biographically in some cases um, and to use the picture um, as a way of sort of speaking through Bacon's voice, I guess, yeah? But there's ways you can do that, you see. I mean, you can let the reader discover that. I mean, it, 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 instead of saying Bacon went to uh, Spain to die, uh, we quote him talking to his doctor saying, uh, I must go to Spain, I must go to Spain. Right. 
And he, he doesn't say to his doctor, I'm, I must go to Spain in order to die with my, you know, near my lover. He doesn't say that. He just says, I must go to Spain. You can leave it at this point after all these pages. I think you can leave it to the reader to make that kind of connection. And then when you get to the, the discussion of the bull, um, the reader can bring to bear uh, his or her own uh, experience of the book and of Bacon's life. And you don't need to dot every I and cross every T. You, you, know, you really must refrain, I, I think, from always bossing around the reader and telling him this and telling him that and, and, uh, and, and not allowing that air that circulates in a good book, I think, uh, where, where the reader is, is bringing his or her own intelligence to bear. You know, another interesting aspect of Bacon is he, he didn't mind uh, showing the autobiographical um, in, in his own paintings. You know, Mark mentioned uh, the, the, the triptychs, the, the great George triptychs after George Dyer's death. But earlier we saw the 1979 uh, self-portrait of the aging queen. And he would actually almost transfer his feel, emotional feelings and intensity of the moment and right there, you would see it, you know, breathed upon the canvas. So if you look at the at, at Bacon himself, he portrayed in his uh, self-portraits, his kind of feelings about his life. So he opens the door in a sense for you to be able to look, you know, to uh, correlate the paintings and his, and his life. He invites those readings, yeah. Um, I said, someone asked, it's an interesting question. Can you comment on how Bacon has been appropriated by other artists? A recent photo book by Magnum, um, for instance, uh, pairs his uh, highly sexualized, disturbing photos with 25, oh, sorry, Antoine uh, Dagata's work with, with Bacon's. Uh, let me just let you answer that, but ask, to pick up on something you mentioned, Mark. It is true that Bacon, maybe, I don't know, like Pollock, or it's hard to think, is an artist who sort of has no obvious imitators, unlike, say, de Kooning. Um, correct me if you think that's not right. But, um, but um, and that is one of the things I, th I thought you might mention. It's quite interesting uh, how they sort of define something that um, uh, Bacon, that is, an artist like Bacon or Pollock that really couldn't be copied. It was so distinct. But I guess there is this question about appropriation and, and his influence as well. Maybe you could speak to that. Well, I think, I think his influence is not very often a direct iconographic or stylistic transference from him to another artist. As you say, he's, he's very hard to, uh, to, to copy. You almost can't. Um, but his influence as a, one of the reasons we use the title Revelations is because this obsession that our culture has, our society with secrets, with exposures, with secret sex lives, with, uh, with everything that's in the closet, not just, not just sex, and I don't mean just homosexuality, but just the, the, the sense that the closet door, whatever it is concealing needs to be opened, that revelatory feeling. I think that that aspect of Bacon does radiate. It's not just Bacon, of course, there's many other motors for this in the culture, but, but Bacon um, doing that the way he did and then the theatrical way that he did it, you know, I mean, there, with the frames and the glazing and, the, and the, the kind of grand guignol quality, this theater of revelation uh, mm -hmm. is something that for some reason uh, is very, very important to our culture. So I think, yes, he, his influence is, is of that kind more than of the classical art historical kind. Annalyn, no? I was just thinking of, there was a moment in the uh, uh, mid seventies where critics were despairing of all of the uh, Francis Bacon imitators who are out there. And it sort of strikes you as interesting that in that moment in time, there were all of these, you know, hundreds in the academies who were trying to be the new Francis Bacon and none of them succeeded. <laughs> well, you can see for in English, in English painting with Jenny Savile, people like that, you can see a, a, a fascination with the kind of, uh, I was gonna say disagreeable body, but that's not what I mean. It, it's with the, the really physical quality of the body. For some reason, English artists have always been very involved with that in the post-war period. Yeah, for sure. And I think Bacon's influence is, is manifest there. And I think he helped, I mean, I think Bacon to some degree helped lead Lucian Freud to that heavy physical feeling for the flesh. Um, people would disagree about that, some people, but, but that insistence on the body, whatever it's doing, the ungainly body,
uh, is something that he certainly propounded and that a lot of artists are interested in. But there is that quality to Megan's work that's sort of the smeared sort of flash photography, that sort of, that particular kind of gesture which we associate with him, which is sort of inimitable without quoting him. Um, it isn't a sort of thing that you can do. Uh, and yet when you see it, you know it's, you know it's Bacon. Um, so um, someone wanted you to comment on, on the screaming popes. I cite them, um, says T.D. Allman, who's asked this question, often when writing about the medieval popes. He got them better than Titian, or he gets them better than Titian. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, Bacon would certainly like you. Um, <laughs> he himself, Bacon, felt very, very inferior to Titian. Yeah, well. Uh, and, uh, and in that painting in particular, he was, he was too afraid to go look at it in person, even though he spent a considerable period of time in Rome at one point. He didn't take the trouble to go look at that painting in person of Innocent, uh, because he was so afraid of its uh, sort of sulfurous, powerful inner world of this, of this, of this, of this man. And it was so such a, I mean, it's one of the best paintings ever. And so so Bacon wouldn't uh, wouldn't actually subject himself to the, the inferiority that he would have felt looking at it. Um, but he he wanted he wanted something similar. He did want to show that feeling of a surface, um, of the splendor and this kind of a completely uh, uh, almost insane interior life, smoking. The, the interesting thing about uh, Bacon though, is he, he grew to hate his popes in particular. You know, that was a series he said he wished he'd never painted. He never said that about the men, the very powerful men, uh, the dark shadowed businessmen that came right after. He went directly from Innocent X into the businessmen. He never kind of uh, you know, you tried to trash his uh, businessmen in quite the same way. I think that also has to do with, he, he returned uh, again and again to the Pope's end moments when he needed inspiration. And with each series, they kind of got weaker. So I think he had a very mixed um, feeling about the Pope's and rightly so. Yeah, but the, the Pope's also represented for him, not just religion. I mean, uh, they, were, they were a sort of historical image of patriarchy, right? Of, uh, I, we don't we don't like to go into all, all the uh, the uh, sort of too much too much psychological stuff. I think people can draw those conclusions for themselves. But Bacon had a very difficult relationship with his father. He didn't like the uh, mainstream morals. He didn't like the uh, the uh, the assertion of male um, male piety and 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 sort of. Uh, 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 you have to behave this way. The exclusion that that represented. So, so his 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 way with the popes is really his way with you know he's making a a, a joke almost with Papa you know. Uh, uh, and and, and T.D. Alban sent along. I mean, as a hist as a historian, he captured the papal rage for power, which I think is absolutely is yeah, absolutely absolutely, and also kind of sent it up. You know, what I mean, he, you know, all the 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 gaudiness uh, was sort of there, but he was working against that. So kind of, you know, bringing it down. But that aspect of power is really so right. I mean, Bacon, Bacon is all about in his art, uh, power and powerlessness. And he knows both. He knows powerlessness as a weakly, sickly infant who's, a, you know, abused by his father. Uh, and he knows power from creating this persona. He's fascinated in there, in in the intersection between power and powerlessness. He's not so interested in the meat in the in the medium territory between those things. He likes that's another reason why he's so important to the 20th century, is because the 20th century saw the expression of such total brute power and also the expression of such powerlessness. So Bacon, who was interested in those two ends of the spectrum and not so much what's in between. Uh, really can speak to that aspect of the century and to uh, uh, to historical power. Um, that's brilliant. As is the book, and and I'm uh, we're we're out of time, but I really want to thank you and thank you for writing this too. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and um, I thank you, Michael. I hope thank you, Michael. I hope everybody gets right now and buys the book. So thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye. Take care.